Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Her Earl Hirsch to be presenting today. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, be sure to stick around for the end of Grand Rounds. The last 10 minutes, we'll be presenting the Evans Award today. Um, so that will be after Dr. Hirsch's um, talk today. Um, but so uh, it will be an exciting talk by Dr. Hirsch. Um, he is a professor of medicine in the Division of Metabolism, Endocrinology, and Nutrition here at the University of Washington. Um, he is also uh, the Diabetes Treatment and Teaching Endowed Chair here at the University. Uh, Dr. Hirsch did his medical education at the University of Min uh, Missouri before going to Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami, Florida for internal medicine residency. He completed his fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Dr. Hirsch is a nationally recognized expert in the field of diabetes. He's made significant contributions to the field through his work in education, research, as well as his clinical work. Um, his research and clinical interests include optimizing strategies for insulin management of patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. He also has an interest in integrating technological advances into the care of patients with diabetes with continuous glucose monitoring, as well as work on artificial pancreas technology. Another longstanding clinical interest of Dr. Hirsch is inpatient management of hyperglycemia, and he is a, has an active clinical practice here at the University of Washington and is the director of the Diabetes Care Center at the University of Washington. Dr. Hirsch has published extensively on the management of diabetes with more than 170 peer-reviewed articles. He has been involved in major national trials that have shaped the practice of caring for patients with diabetes, including the DCCT and the ACCORD trials. He has also uh, published work that has um, shown the importance of glucose variability on outcomes in patients with diabetes uh, beyond just hemoglobin A1C control. Um, Dr. Hirsch has also been involved in uh, national guideline committees um, that have shaped practice um, throughout the United States, uh, most recently publishing guidelines on the management of type 2 diabetes, uh, which was recently put forth by the American College of Endocrinology. Dr. Hirsch has received numerous awards for his excellence in research, education, and clinical care. Um, including receiving the Josiah K. Lilly Award in 2013 for outstanding contributions to the field of diabetes, which was awarded by the American Diabetes Association. So today, Dr. Hirsch will be discussing insulin prices in America, an example of a system in disarray. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hirsch. Thank you, Andrew. It's um Great to be here, I appreciate the invitation. And um, you know, I think for all of us in the room, think about today because 10 years from now, you don't know what you'll be thinking about or talking about or researching because 10 years ago, I never would have thought I'd be doing grand rounds on this topic, but, but here I am. Um, I've become very interested in this topic about insulin pricing and the whole system, which is kind of appropriate given what's going on in Washington DC today. We are, uh, we are in store for quite an interesting um, grand round and I think quite an interesting day in Washington, DC. These are my dualities. You can see both from a research and consultant point of view. And if you still don't trust me, I will be happy to share my tax forms with you. <laughs> okay. Now, traditionally in grand rounds, what we do is we like to present and start with a case. And this is an actual patient. You are called to the ED to see a newly diagnosed 30-year-old man with type 1 diabetes and mild DKA. He is treated and he is stable for discharge. He is taught how to inject insulin in the ED and he is sent home with an appointment scheduled in the next day in the diabetes clinic, our diabetes care center. Prescriptions were provided for pens for Glargine and Lyspro. He has no insurance. The two boxes of insulin, five pens each, cost $818. That's what his pens cost without any insurance. He's a landscaper. This is unaffordable. So let's go back to the beginning. Are there any medical students in the audience? Raise your hand. 
There's a few of you, good. Because insulin was discovered by Banting, a surgeon, and Charles Best, who at the time was a medical student. And in a generous gesture that unfortunately didn't start a trend, they sold the patent for one dollar so that cheap insulin would become quickly available. And it worked like a charm. Within two years, Eli Lilly, a U.S. company in Indianapolis, had sold 60 million units of its purified extract of pig and cow pancreas. And one of the pictures that were taken um, was this picture right here. And let's see if the pointer works. Yes, so the gentleman here in the mustache is McLeod, and J.J. Uh, McLeod actually split the Nobel Prize with Fred Banting. This is best. And this gentleman right here, his name was George Clues. He actually went by Alec, and his father ended up doing his research training with Dr. Best many years later, but it was his grandson that's the most interesting. His grandson was Dr. Alec Clues, our vascular surgeon who passed away almost two years ago. And many of you didn't know Dr. Clues, is, um, uh, his family's role in the discovery of insulin. But a few months before Dr. Clues passed away at a very young age, he had written and published this book, The Doc and the Duchess, about his grandfather and his grandmother. And um, I have a copy of the book. It's fascinating. There is specific parts in the book, chapters on the discovery of insulin, but he did a lot more than this. But um, I want to make sure everybody knows that we actually had a faculty member whose family was intimately involved with the discovery of insulin. Now, if you were an endocrine fellow in the 1940s, this is the sales tools that was used um, from the Eli Lilly rep. So um, what I'm showing you, Dr. Bremner, you probably remember this when you were an endocrine fellow. Um, this, is, this, is, this is what was used. <laughs> This is what Dr. Bremner had when the uh, sales representative, re representative came to his clinic. And uh, you can go on to the NIH website, and what you see is this pancreas gland, and it really just represents the pancreas that is cut up to show the original structure of these animal pancreas. And then the pancreas gland is ground into fine acid and alcohol water mixture. The liquid is then separated into this muck, and then what happens is the filtrate from the previous picture is then concentrated in acid water. The acid water is removed, and then the solution is then saturated with sodium chloride, and eventually you get this pure, what, is, what we now call regular insulin. This was U40 insulin in the early 1940s. But what also happened in the late 30s and early 40s, and some of you in the room may remember this, this protamine insulin, this, is, this was called PZI which came off the market in the late 1980s. But this is how insulin was sold, and this is how insulin was taught back in the 1940s. But let's go back. This is New York Times, the failing New York Times in 1924. They were, even in 1924. And there was an article um, to supply insulin for free from the British patients who could not pay for their insulin. And as it turns out, the Brits were going to pay for the insulin for those people who could not afford it. And as it turns out, this was 8 to 10 shillings a week, which in today's money would be about 7 cents a week of is what the insulin cost was in 1924. So remember that. But we have our newly diagnosed patient in the ED in 2017 who doesn't have insurance. What about him? Are there still uninsured Americans in the era of the ACA, which may be going away um, very soon? But let's look at the data. This comes from the Kaiser Family uh, Foundation. And what you can see is that in 2013, when this all started, we were at 16.6% .6 of our population without insurance. It then went down to 10.5% in 2015, and then by 2016, this number dropped to 9.1% uninsured. This is what the ACA has done for us. My personal opinion is this is a very good thing, but it's not a good thing if you have newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes. The cost of medications have become a very hot topic. I don't have to tell this audience about what has happened recently with the EpiPen in the last year and all of the publicity this has received. And there has been sticker shock with more than just the EpiPen. 
While 30 name brand drugs have doubled in price between 2010 and 2015, three of the top six drugs were insulin. And you can see what these drugs were. Um, this is U500 human insulin. The percent increase was 325%. Here's the EpiPen. Here's Premer and Vaginal Cream. And then the last two here was insulin Detamir and insulin Glargine, two basal insulins, each up around 169% between 2010 and 2015. Well, why is this? And we are certainly seeing this in our clinic. So in 2016, this one uh, author wrote, almost a century after its discovery, insulin remains out of the reach of millions of people against the wishes of its discoverers. It's simply too expensive of a drug for a disease that makes no distinctions of class, color, or birthplace. Many people find this shameful. But that's prophetic because not everybody finds this shameful. And in fact, just earlier this week, we heard from Mo Brooks, a Republican congressman from Alabama, that the new health care plan that's being voted on today, this proposal will require people with higher costs to contribute more. People who lead good lives are healthy and have done all of the things to keep their bodies healthy. These are the people who are seeing their costs skyrocketing. And he went on to say that this is just not the right way we should be doing health care. And of course, I haven't spoken to Kate P. Hoker about her Medicaid patients at Children's Hospital or Susan Marshall or Bonnie Ramsey about all the cystic fibrosis patients um, who are Medicaid patients at Children's Hospital, but our patients too. We have done nothing um, in terms of leading a good and healthy life to have some genetic condition to cause some catastrophic healthcare crisis. But that is what this particular um, uh, gentleman was saying earlier this week, and I guess I just had a problem with that. And again, I never thought, I, I'm a, I, I talk about science, but we are obviously now into deep politics. So we've come a long way, or have we? The World Health Organization Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases in 2013 to 2020, and their target as far as insulin is concerned, is an 80% availability of affordable basic technologies and essential medicines, including generics, required to treat major non-communicable diseases in both public and private facilities. So the target at the world level for low-income and mid-income countries is to get to 80% of the population to have insulin, which parenthetically, if you have type 1 diabetes, you need for survival. So that is the bar. And what I can tell you is yesterday, yesterday this consortium I am on um, noted that part of this 80% is to get biosimilar insulin analogs also, not just human insulin. So how do we do? And when I say we, I'm not just talking about us sitting here in Seattle as Americans. I'm talking about us as a society globally. And let's, let's look at the data for a moment. The average availability in these low and income, mid-income countries was 56% in the public sector and 39% in the private sector. That is avail availability of insulin. And when you actually look at the data, and there's a lot of data here, just to point out. In Kyrgyzstan, there is 93% of the public sector has access to insulin, but 0% in the private sector. In, in Mali, for example, it's 17% in the public and 60% in the private have access to insulin. And this is the most interesting. This is Mexico, and this is before the wall is built. It's 31% of the public and 27% of the private sector has access to insulin access to insulin, less than a third. And, and to me, this is absolutely incredible. And when you actually add it up, only two in the 15 in the private and six of the 15 of the public sectors meet the World Health Organization's target of 80% of the population having access to insulin. And that is a low bar and we are not even close. So just realize that when we talk about access, that we don't want to confuse access with costs. The two are related, but are not necessarily identical. High costs can be seen with good access. So what I did here is going back to 1960, all the way to 2017, I wanted to see how much a unit of insulin costs. And what I did was I converted U40 insulin 
to U100. And what I also did was I used something called Tom's Medical Inflation Calculator, which I got online, so I could calculate what is the cost of insulin. And the white bars here are regular insulin, and a unit of insulin in 1960 was 0.2 cents for a unit of insulin. It doubled by 1975. Nobody really screamed about that. And nobody screamed in 1983 when that same unit of insulin was two cents. Now we're using human insulin, which was introduced in 1982. 1996 was an important year because now we have our first insulin analog, insulin Lyspro. And you can see there was a little bit of a premium of insulin Lyspro compared to regular insulin. The uh, difference increased further in 2001, regular insulin didn't change. And in fact, in 2005, here were nine years after the introduction of Lyspro, regular insulin was still three cents a unit, whereas now the analog was eight cents. And look at where we are now. Depending on where you go to look, that same unit of regular insulin is 14 cents. A unit of Lyspro is 26 cents. And this is the interesting one. Rely on regular insulin. This is the same regular insulin that you purchase, but you purchase it at Walmart. They have their own brand. It changes contracts between Lilly and Novo. Right now, I believe it's Novo. But you can get a vial of insulin for $25 a vial, NPH, regular, or 70-30, 2.5 cents for a unit of insulin. Across the street at the regular pharmacy, that same unit of insulin is 14 cents. The good news is, we have Walmarts here in Western Washington, and this is where a lot of our patients now are getting their insulin. The U.S. prices have tripled, according to this article last year by Bill Herman in JAMA, tripled between 2002 and 2013, while other diabetes drugs have actually fallen in price, interestingly enough. Now, here's the other interesting thing. Insulin is now the sixth most expensive liquid on Earth, over $26,000 a liter, and it's ranked between Chanel number no. 5 and Mercury. And for, the, and for those of you who are keeping score, Scorpion Venom was number one, King Cobra Venom was number two, and for those of you from the 1960s, LSD was number three. But this is, this is where insulin is compared to these other, compared to these other uh, liquids. So... Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? So let's think about this. These are the bar mitzvah gifts through the decades, okay? In the 1960s to 1970s, this was my era, I got savings bonds, okay? In the 1980s to 1990s, we gave gift cards. In the 2000s, we gave stocks, and these kids did very well with Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. In 2017, we give a vial of Lantus, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's the same net worth, okay? That's what we are doing. So our system really is in disarray. And what many people don't realize is it all starts with the pharmacy benefit manager. And I didn't really understand when I start, started to get interested in this topic what the PBM or pharmacy benefit manager was. Now, deep down, I am still an endocrinologist. And the way I think about this is that the PBM is the pituitary of the system with feedback loops. And the way it works is you have the employer down here who pays the premium to the health plan, and they will, of course, pay the PBM, and the PBM will then work with the pharmaceutical company to get a preferred placement on the formulary, but this is all based on negotiated rebates, which feedbacks to the PBM. The PBM will then negotiate uh, costs with the pharmacy. The drug will eventually get to the beneficiary. We are sort of an asterisk down here because what we do down here is all based on whether something is covered or not. But this is a, a massive mess, and I think it's safe to say that how the money flows is complex, but it's important. And there are so many pieces in this system. Everybody wants some of the money from the top. So this is part of the problem right now. It's too complicated. As far as the payers are concerned, this includes both the PBMs and the health plans. The health plans may choose to partner with the PBM for prescription benefits, but the PBM will then negotiate discounts and rebates with manufacturers on, quote, behalf of the plans and employers. Now, Kasia Lipska from Yale, she wrote an op-ed in the New York Times last year, and she said, in reality, this is a conflict of interest. The system incentivizes them to choose the products with the largest rebate. 
And these rebates, she went on to say, look suspicious, suspiciously similar to kickbacks. The rebates are not publicly disclosed, but they are sizable. Analysts estimate that those payments and other backroom deals amount to as much as 50% of the list price of insulin. Now, I should come and say that some of the companies are now being a little bit more transparent about these rebates, but I didn't know what a kickback was. So I went to the MiriamWebster.com dictionary, and a kickback is an amount of money that is given to somebody in return for providing help in a secret and dishonest business deal. This is our healthcare system, a secret and dishonest business deal. Um, and this is what we have evolved to over the last few years. So our system is in disarray, and accounting for the difference between the lit and the list and that pricing, this comes from a, J, a Janssen or a J and J um, article, and what you can see is that there is a hundred and six billion dollars in total rebates and discounts that were given in 2015, compared to only 60, 67 billion dollars in 2013. So these rebates are what is driving the system, and so what the pharmaceutical companies have to do since they're rebating this is they have to increase the costs so they can keep their profit margins stable, as I will show you. So if you go to the Eli Lilly website, what you will find is that our discounts are now larger than ever. Lilly cut the average US list price of our medicines by a full 50% last year via rebates and discounts. That's nearly twice as much as we did just five years ago when the average discount was 28%. So there's some transparency here, that's a good thing. Because of these growing discounts, the average U.S. net price of Lilly Medicines, the actual amount we recouped from selling our products rose 2.4% last year, and they went on to say this does not keep up with medical inflation. So this is, this is on the Lilly website. So what is this list price? Well, what the insulin companies tell me is it's not what's paid, but rather a place to start confidential negotiations with the middleman. It's sort of like going into your Toyota dealer and you see the list price on that Camry or that RAV4, but you know that's not what you're going to pay. You're going to negotiate something else. It's the same with insulin and these PBMs. Please understand that the middlemen are driving the insulin companies to maintain their high profit margins. The real problem is the system is out of control to maintain these high profit margins some people actually do pay the list price or close to it. So who does pay this list price? Well, the patients with high deductibles and many patients, $4,000, $6,000, and they don't understand the implications with the Affordable Care Act. I haven't found this written, but I am told that now one third of Americans have a high deductible. I am told that in the state of Wyoming, which is part of the whammy system, that there is only one exchange, and the deductible in the state of Wyoming is $11,000. $11,000. People just can't do that. So these people with high deductibles, they have to pay this list price, which is really not meant for them in the beginning. Patients reaching the donut hole early in the year. Now, we are told that that's supposed to go away by 2020. But right now, when you have patients reaching that donut hole in March, April, and May, it is really brutal, especially to get a medication they need to survive. Young patients off their parents' insurance for the first time who don't know how to navigate the system. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we are starting Molly Carlson and, and uh, Craig Kaplan, KP Oker and I, we're starting this adolescent transition clinic. This is a huge problem for these kids getting insulin and not ending up in an ER or worse. Patients with commercial insurance who simply can't afford the high copays. This is what comes up in our clinic every day. They can't afford their copays for insulin. We have patients telling us that they're paying more for their insulin than for their mortgage. It's that bad. Uninsured Americans with the Affordable Care Act, I showed you, 9.1% of Americans. You get hit with cancer, you get hit with type 1 diabetes, and you're uninsured. And this is now. What is this going to look like two, three years from now? I, I, I don't know. We may know a little bit more about that later today. So it's very interesting. Drug channel companies, so these are the, these are the PBMs. And you recognize many of these names. CVS Health, McKesson, Amerisource Bergen, Express Scripts, 
Holding. You recognize these names. And this is really a fascinating but very complicated slide, but I want to first look at the revenues in 2014 of these Fortune 500 drug channel companies. They are averaging $87 billion in revenues. And you look at that and you say, wow. And then you look at the total return to investors, and you see they're bringing to investors 30%. And all I can say with my wife here, I, I wish we had some of this, or maybe in the UW, in the, my UW retirement, I have a lot of these companies. Because if I did, I'm doing very well. But that's not the point. That's the investors. If you actually look at their profit margin, and that's what I want you to pay attention to, and it was Peter Capel who actually pointed this out to me, their profit margin is averaging 1.4%. 1.4%. They're making money, but they're not making the big bucks, okay? Really important. So, if you're an internal medicine resident, or if you're an endocrine fellow, or you're any healthcare provider, why is a lowly endocrinologist like me talking to you at Medical Grand Rounds about antitrust laws? Because at the end of the day, it's the antitrust laws that this is all about. So if you look it up, you find out that in the United States, antitrust law is a collection of federal and state government laws that regulates the conduct and organization of business corporations, generally to promote fair competition for the benefit of consumers. And this is what got me into all kinds of trouble. Because what does this have to do with insulin? Well, I gave a talk two years ago at the ADA meeting in Boston, and I showed this, these two slides. I showed that on May 30th, 2014, the, pi the price of glargine was increased by 16.1% by Sanofi, and literally the next day, Novo Nordisk inc increased the price of insulin Detamir, the competition, by 16.1%. Is this collusion? Because this pattern repeated itself six months later, and this has actually happened 13 times for these two products, with a total sale globally of $11 billion billion with a B. And this is the slide. It's called shadow pricing, whereas Detamir came out after Glargine, but the two went up and they shadowed each other 13 times. And the question is, is this an antitrust violation? When I, when I showed this slide in Boston, I had never talked to an antitrust attorney before. I've talked to many antitrust attorneys <laughs> because, you know, and everything I'm showing you you know, is online. This is all, you know, I'm just Google's best friend here. This is not, I'm not showing you anything that nobody else can see. So a lot has happened. Our friend Bernie Sanders, this is the Friday before the election in November, he decided to sick the Department of Justice against Lily Novo Nordisk and Sanofi to see if there was collusion. And he talks about these shadow pricing. This is a big part of what he talks about. Furthermore, the New York Times had this article about more class, class action lawsuits against the insulin companies, and there have been many. I can't even keep up with them. And not only that, we now have class action lawsuits against the PBMs. But what's even more interesting, just Monday of this week, on Reuters, Eli Lilly says got civil investigators to demand from Washington AG's office about the pricing of insulin products. That was just this week. I mean, it seems to me that the Washington AG, what they may be most known for is uh, the travel ban and now insulin. Because, I mean, this is, this is a global issue. So this is where the rubber hits the road. And um, this is what... Again, this is online, but this is what they don't want you to see. They be in the pharmaceutical industry in general. I'm not talking about the insulin companies. Note that the pharmaceutical companies, their profit margin is close to 20%. The only thing close to that are the banks. We have car makers, we have oil and gas, we have media. Um, Dr. Bremner, where does the Department of Medicine fall on this? I mean, yeah, yeah, we're on, <laughs> yeah, shift it to the left. And, and I look at my division of metabolism, uh, Christine Shinnikoff and uh, Stephanie Page. I mean, this is incredible. You look at the average restaurant. You look at an academic medical center where we just want to be a little bit on the right side of this ledger. But these pharmaceutical companies are up there near 20%. Okay. If we look at the world's largest pharmaceutical firms, and these are not 
necessarily the most profitable. What you can see here is, well, let me even go back for a second. I want to show you that Pfizer, Pfizer has a profit margin of 43%. That's the most. And there's a big, um, there is actually a very large range here because what you see here is this is, this is Pfizer. This was a year difference. 42% for the highest in the pharmaceuticals and 10% for the lowest. So there's, there's this large range for big pharma in terms of what the profit margin is. And what you see is Pfizer is at 43%. But if we go to the insulin companies, we, we see Sanofi, their profit margin is 11%. So they're actually at the low end of this. But what's interesting, their sales and marketing is 21%. It's 9.1 billion, which is quite a bit more than the R&D because what happens generically with all these companies, they say they have to keep raising the prices for the R&D, the research and development, but they actually spend more on sales and marketing. Now let's look at Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly is more like at the average in terms of the uh, uh, pharmaceutical sector. They're right at 20%. They spend 25% of their uh, revenue on sales and marketing. They don't do nearly as much more on sales and marketing as many of the others, just a little bit more, $0.2 billion more than they do on R&D. Um, Novo Nordisk is not in the top pharmaceutical firms, but if you go online, you can find it. And to be complete, Novo Nordisk, which is a smaller company, in 2014 had a profit index of 29.8%. So they're at the high end, about 30%. So we have all three ends of this profit margin, and it's the profit margin that is driving all of this. To keep the shareholders happy, these are all publicly traded companies, it's all about the profit margin, and this is a topic that nobody wants to talk about because this is, this is the stuff you really have to look hard to find this information. So if you compare prices of insulin around the world, and I have done that, it's kind of interesting when you look at NPH insulin, and I'm not talking about rely on, comparing uh, India and the UK and Spain and the USA up here. And of course, when you compare insulin at the same time, all of the insulin is more expensive in the US. Degodec is our new basal insulin. It only comes in pens, but what I did was I, um, I uh, changed it to what it would be per 10 mLs, and it's $311 per 10 mLs. But you can see, you can go around the world and you can see that our system our system really promotes having this expensive insulin. And what has happened in the last five plus years or so is we are, we've stepped over the line to what our society says is reasonable for a drug that you have to have to survive. And that's what's happened. So what about patient assistance programs? And what about the copay cards? Well, the patient assistance programs, according to one author, it's a $4 billion a year industry that is nothing more than marketing schemes and a PR strategy dressed up to look like altruism. By pricing the drugs too high, companies actually create the need for these patient assistance programs, according to this one author last year. What about the copay cards? One author says this is the part of doing business for the industry. They have become a requisite for the launch of a branded drug and are considered part of the industry's do good machinery. And there has been a lot written about this recently, especially in the New England Journal of Medicine. Because what these copay cards do is they take the financial burden from the patient and puts more of it on the insurer, which will ultimately result in higher premiums. So in the long term, this really is not a good thing. And it furthermore reduces the incentives to the pharma companies to offer price concessions for preferred tier placement. It gets rid of the tier system. And so, you know, we have two systems going at once with these copay cards. A lot of problems with these. So I would say the real conclusion is we are all struggling with a system that is dysfunctional to the point patients can't get their insulin, often required for survival. We are all doing what we can despite the obstacles, which are fundamentally due to Americans paying for the majority of all drugs while allowing the pharma companies to make this large profit margin and surprisingly, the margins are not as high for the PBMs. So the statistic to realize is that in Canada and the United States, we account for 12% of the insulin use in the world, yet we pay for 53% of the insulin. 12% we use, we pay for 53%. China, 
They use 25% of the insulin in the world, yet they pay for 4%. That's, these are the statistics. For many, going backwards to human insulin at Walmart, and now you can actually get human insulin at CVS, is the only solution. And so we're using more and more NPH and regular in our clinic. So this is an example of NPH insulin. This is a 45-year-old man who still had insulin Isopro from 2015. He had a few continuous glucose monitors that he used from the year before. His deductible is $4,000. He can't afford the list price of glargine since he has to go through his deductible first. So he simply used NPH instead. His hemoglobin A1C is 6.9%. And if we look at his continuous glucose monitoring, what you see is he goes up overnight when he's asleep. And this is what we used to do with NPH, Paul Fredlin. You remember better than anybody. We had them have bedtime snacks. He protected himself. He never had nocturnal hypoglycemia. Watching his blood sugars the rest of the day, he did well. He actually did fine with NPH insulin at $25 a vial. And I would argue NPH isn't so bad if you know how to use it. And this guy obviously figured out how to use it. So a Santa Fe rep told me going from Lantus to Tugeo is like going from an iPhone 6 to an iPhone 7, OK? My thought is going from an analog to human insulin is like going from an iPhone 6 to an iPhone 5. It works. I actually still have my iPhone 5. There's nothing wrong with it. It works just fine. There are many tricks to using human insulin safely in type 2 diabetes in particular, but little training in the medical schools, residencies, even fellowships, little CME due to lack of insulin company funding. I'm, I'm proud to say, you know, Tracy Tiley, when we do our diabetes CME, she goes through this in detail, how to use NPH and regular. And, and certainly with our fellows, this is a major part now of their training because many of our patients, they have no choice. And by the way, for mealtime insulin in type 2 diabetes, there is no advantage of hypoglycemia with an insulin analog compared to regular insulin. There's no advantage at all. Huge cost savings. So we're using a lot of regular, and we're certainly using a lot of NPH. Not because we want to, but because we have no choice. So another option for many, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, Canada. Is getting, Canada, is getting insulin from Canada actually legal? Well, it's illegal for Americans to order and receive prescriptions from pharmacies in Canada. That's the US law. But Canadian pharmacies can ship prescriptions to the US. That's the Canadian law. And in fact, Health Canada, in their official statement, they not only condone it, but they encourage the cross-border sale of drugs to the US because it's become an important business in Canada. This is what has happened. So bringing small quantities of medication across the US border, not on mail order, but if you're going to drive it through the border for personal use, it is allowed. If you go online and you look at the cost, what you see is the glargine pens in Canada are 165 compared to 381 in the US. On the day I looked at this, one vial of Lysepro in Canada is $64. But that's not, that's not the point. The point is, even in Canada, when our patients go up there, they can find cheaper insulin. First of all, you don't need a prescription when you buy insulin in Canada for any insulin. And our patients can find it for $35 a vial. $35 a vial. You can get any insulin you want. Any insulin you want, analog or human insulin. So that's what many of our patients are now doing. Are there other solutions? Well, here's a possibility from something called Milliman Client Report, and it's really interesting. Exempt deductibles for insulin. No deductibles. So ideally, savings from the rebates will be passed on to an affordable copay at the time the patient gets their insulin immediately. Currently, paying the deductible is what brings down a population's premiums. This is called the cost sharing. One idea is to eliminate this cost sharing, which would result in higher premiums. If we're going to get rid of premiums for, if we're going to get rid of the deductible for insulin, we're going to pass on the premiums to everybody else. The estimated increase in costs according to this document, would be $2.63 to a little over $5 per member per year. So we're talking on average maybe three or four bucks a year if we get rid of the deductible for insulin. 
Out-of-pocket savings to insulin users would average $430 per patient per year. So is this, does this sound like a good deal? Well, I thought a lot about it. And in further reflection, my opinion is that this plan doesn't attack the real problem because what it does is that it cost shifts the money flow, but the manufacturer and the PBM, nothing changes. It's just cost shifting the flow to patients who don't take insulin to patient, uh, patients who do take insulin to patients who don't. This is a great option if you are a company that sells insulin, especially if the other option is a congressional hearing with an outcome resulting in competitive bidding type of conclusion or worse. We have seen this with blood glucose test strips. In 2013, under the ACA, we now have competitive bidding so that Medicare has a very fixed low price for cost, the cost of these glucose test strips. Patients don't have to fret anymore. They actually can get their cost, their strips, um, at a reasonable price. Unfortunately, that has created all kinds of downstream problems with the uh, glucose test strip business. But nevertheless, I don't think the insulin companies want to see a congressional or a Senate hearing. Nevertheless, the American Diabetes Association called on Congress to hold hearings on insulin prices. This happened last November. They have since put up a petition online. I am told there are 250,000 signatures for Congress to hold hearings on insulin pricing. So this is a big deal. The worst nightmare if you sell insulin for a living, in my opinion, is having a Senate hearing looking across the table with this guy, or her, or him, and especially Claire McCaskill. Now, she's my heroine. She is so knowledgeable. I've actually spoken several times to her associates in Jefferson City, Missouri. She is the one who is really pushing this, and um, I think we're going to hear more from Senator McCaskill. This was an email that was sent to me last summer. I have cared for three patients this summer with DKA because they couldn't afford their insulin. Many more are abysmally controlled based solely on costs. My Medicare patients suffer the most. I get more and more frustrated every day and am spending many hours procuring resources for these patients. It truly feels like no one but the care team is on the patient's side. This was a copy and paste from this provider who is just at her wit's end. Bottom line, this is a Canadian $100 bill. You can see here on the $100 bill, the Canadians are very proud of their insulin discovery, which is right there on the $100 bill. And 100 is really significant because as we approach the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin, it is safe to say that Banting, Best, McLeod, and even Dr. Clues would be shaking their heads if they could see what has happened to insulin pricing in the United States. I want to give thanks to where thanks is due. I want to give thanks to my colleagues and staff in the Diabetes Care Center, particularly Peter, Rhea, Faiza, Janelle, and David, who work with me as we do these PAs and we work and work to get insulin for our patients. It is, it is, it is quite a struggle. In fact, the day before yesterday, I had a PA for generic simvastatin. It's, it's, it's out of control, the bureaucracy, and my, my group in the DCC have really helped me. I want to thank them. I want to thank my colleagues and friends around the country who are all as passionate or even more so than me. Uh, Mayor Davidson, Des Schatz, Matt Riddle, Kasha, Kasha Lipska, Lauren Wisner green Bob Ratner, Jay Schuyler, Kate Roberts, Roberts, Janelle Wright, and Peter Capel. Peter, thank you. Thank you for being such a proponent of this going back for decades now. It is appreciated because our patients all thank you. I want to thank Jordan Wells from Eli Lilly, who has really taught me a lot about the economics of insulin. Thank you, Jordan. And I want to thank my family. I want to thank my daughter, Barbara. I want to thank my wife, Ruth. Ruth did not, um, she usually checks my slides out to make sure I didn't step over the line anywhere. She did not check the slides today. Hopefully I didn't step over any lines, Ruth, but uh, thank you for all of your support in this fight over the last few years. Finally, I want to thank my patients who keep me humble as we all struggle to obtain affordable insulin, and it has been a struggle. So with that, I thank you all and be happy to take your questions.
Earl, I, I was struck by your data that at Walmart, you can buy insulin at 2.5 cents per unit. Can you tell us whether the companies are breaking even at that price? Yeah, the question is, did everybody hear the question? The question is, are the companies breaking insulin at Walmart at 25 bucks a vial or 2.5 cents? And, and the answer is, I have tried like crazy to find out what does it cost to make a vial of insulin. I have data, but you know, like CNN, I can't confirm it. So, but, but here's, here's, the, here's the thing. So I'm, I, I can't answer the question, but here's the thing. I don't, even if they're losing money, and I don't think they are, but even if they are, they track this. And they're bringing so many more people into their store. And for the people who come in and buy their insulin at $25 a vial, these are people who buy in their grocery, their toiletries, all their other things, and they're buying other medical supplies there. So my guess is, and they're very smart people, my guess is they wouldn't be doing this if they were overall losing money. It may be a loss leader. We, we honestly don't know. So th thank you so much, Earl. That was brilliant and, and inspiring and, and anger-inducing. Um, something so important for all of us to know is that the almost identical thing is happening with inhalers for COPD and asthma, that if you go to GoodRx and you compare the cost of a single inhaler, just about any inhaler you choose for COPD or asthma, you're looking at over $400 for a single inhaler. Oh. And, and, the, and the, the way that every single brand name product is exactly the same leads to the, the conclusion that there has to be the exact same antitrust violation happening with shadow pricing for those inhalers. And, and these are, you know, absolutely, you know, life-saving drugs that a huge proportion of the U.S. public needs, and it's just makes you crazy. Well, thank you, Barack. I did not know that, but I think the real point is I'm focused on insulin, a life-saving um, medication. I think it's the whole system. I mean, I look now at the cost of colchicine. Colchicine is now unaffordable for patients. I mean, how can that be? But thank you. Earl. Uh, yeah, that was a very entertaining and enlightening presentation. But I'm still a little confused about why there are some drugs where this happens and you see this competitive spiral and these outrageous prices. And then I think the majority of drugs, that's not happening. So how does insulin get caught up in this and the COPD inhalers, but not most other drugs? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, why is it? So the, the real issue for insulin, and I can't, I, can, I can't really even speculate about the inhalers, but as far as insulin is concerned, we don't have a generic. We are just now coming out with a biosimilar. Insulin is 96 years old, and it's a large molecule, and it's very difficult to make. We now have our first biosimilar. And when Congress passed these biosimilar laws a few years ago, it was their hope that they would be treated like generics. They're more difficult to make. They're going to be more expensive than a generic simvastatin or enalapril, but they're harder to make. And unfortunately, the actual cost uh, to the patient for a biosimilar is no more than 10 to 20% less than, than what we see with um, the trade name, in this case, Glargine. So it is, it is unfortunate that this is the case. Um, you would think that when you had a biosimilar, they would want to get more of the market. But even having that 10 to 20% reduction in the list price is getting them more of the market because it's very possible, in fact, likely with the PBMs, there's a bigger rebate. And because of that bigger rebate to the middleman, which is not being passed on all the time to the patient, that is really the problem. But it has to do with the fact that we've never seen the generic. These are large molecules. And by the way, it's not just insulin. It's all the large molecule injectables, um, EPO, for example, um, erythropoietin, and some of the other oncology drugs, rheumatoid arthritis drugs, biologics. It's the same thing. Go ahead. Very interesting talk for an economist. My Which I am not. <laughs> My question is this. Um, roughly 750 billion in, in aggregate healthcare expenditures is considered waste. 
How is this related to these excess profits by the drug companies? So that's 700, I want to make sure I understand the question. That 750 billion is everything, not just the pharmaceuticals. It's everything. It's everything. So all the unnecessary x-rays we do for lower back pain and, and, and all of that. How much of this is from the pharmaceuticals? I, I, I can't even begin to answer that. Um, I can't even begin to answer that. I know that we don't use diabetes drugs as well as we could from a cost-effective um, point of view. And this is a whole other grand rounds. For example, we now have two drugs, and we may actually have a third one when we learn the results of another study next month. They're expensive, non-generic drugs, but they reduce the risk of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality. And so there's going to be a cost-effectiveness base for these expensive drugs that most primary care physicians as of yet don't know about, but as the cost-effectiveness data come out, I think they will. For example, empagliflozin, which goes by the trade name Jardiance, now on the, pa on the package insert, it says that there is a reduction of cardiovascular mortality. So it's a very complicated um, question, and the answer is even more complicated, so I'm not even going to try. Thank you very much, Dr. Hirsch. Thank you.